Language plays a pivotal role in the act of communication. If two people cannot perceive the words of each other, this would inevitably lead to a breakdown of fundamental understanding. Could this then be the very reason for historical war? If we all spoke the same language, would there be any need for conflict? Two worlds connected by the artifact of a religious deity, culturally different but strikingly similar, if you were to peel back the outer aesthetic layer. What if these two worlds were to come dangerously close to each other, like the forbidden kiss of a flame to the delicate beat of a moth's wings? Today's game, Tales of Eternia, examines these themes. Tales of Eternia was first published on the Sony PlayStation under the moniker Tales of Destiny 2, in what would become a kerfuffle that the Final Fantasy series also experienced back in the SNES days. Anyway, to prevent any confusion, Tales of Eternia is the third game in the Tales of series, and has no relation to the previous game Tales of Destiny, other than that they both fall into the Tales of series, and share similar naming conventions. The real Tales of Destiny 2 did not leave Japan's shores and was the fourth game in the series, one which I intend to cover in the future. In any case, Tales of Eternia was created by a wolf team and published for the Sony PlayStation between 2000 and 2001 across Japan and North America. It was later ported to the Sony PlayStation Portable Worldwide in 2006 by Ubisoft, bearing its correct name. For the purposes of this review, I played the game on the PSP. We commence this tale as Reed Herschel, a young man living in the remote village of Rashians. Not much happens in this sleepy village, and he enjoys a quiet life with friend Farrah Orsted. One day, when the two are chilling in a watchtower that looks an awful lot like it's being plucked straight out of a Ghibli film, a foreign object hurtles out of the sky cleaving the tower in two. Narrowly avoiding injury, Farrah runs off to the crash site of the foreign matter, leaving Reed to follow behind. Approaching the wreckage, the two discover a girl with a crystal orb embedded in her head who speaks a language entirely unfamiliar. Not wanting to leave the girl alone in the woods, despite not being able to understand her, they take her back to the village elder hoping for some advice. Unfortunately, in hot pursuit, a man who has the incorrect address for renovations beats a hole in the wall and attempts to take the girl back. Defeating the man, Reed and Farrah are blamed for the damage and asked to leave the village due to having been the cause of misfortune in the past. With nothing but each other and the clothes on their backs, the three set out on a journey to find where the girl came from, which turns into a much larger adventure to save two worlds. You see, the world Reed and Farrah live upon is called Inferior, bound to another world called Celestia by an orbital barrier called the Seyfert Ring. Travel between the two worlds is unheard of, and due to no contact in thousands of years, the Inferian race has annulled the Celestians in historical texts as savages. Inferior is a temperate world blessed by light-aligned beings called Kramals that govern the elements of water, wind, and fire. Celestia, on the other hand, is a rugged, cold world governed by earth, ice, and lightning Kramals who are aligned with darkness. I enjoyed that both worlds were visually distinct with races of people that lived their lives differently. Inferior, for example, has a European-style monarchy that governs the entire world, whereas Celestia is more sci-fi orientated, with high-tech gadgets, unseen feats of science, and a people with a strong lust for domination and power. I loved how the cultures of both worlds juxtaposed each other, yet the people of them had similar goals and motivations, which they'd discover if they only stopped and tried to understand each other. Overall, I appreciated the narrative of Tales of Eternia as it took you on an adventure across Inferior and beyond to the lands of Celestia which float in the sky like a heavenly body. Where in my previous review of Tales of Destiny I bemoaned the structure, pace, and the characters, I can gladly say that this was not the case for Tales of Eternia. The entire way through the game I was always excited to see what happened next, and this kept me pushing on through the various areas of the game that may have become a slog otherwise. Particularly, I enjoyed the journey of Reed and Farrah coming to understand Meredith, the foreign girl, as well as discovering, late game, what it was exactly that Reed and Farrah had done to their home village in their youth. In fact, the way that this information is initially disclosed comes about as some of the best writing in the game, so it's something for you to look forward to if you have never played it. A key theme of the game is the fact that the Celestians speak a different language to those that live on Inferior. However, as you progress a little into the story, you learn that the language is the same as the words spoken when an Inferior Kramer Mage casts a spell, Melnix. 
a long lost language of the Melnik Empire which fell to ruin aeons ago. I enjoyed the amount of effort put into the denotation of the Melnik language, as opposed to say Final Fantasy X, which merely scrambled the alphabet for the Albed language. The fact that even a unique script was considered to represent Melnix meant that the language felt more mysterious and kept to the game's diegesis. I really liked this a lot. Also, the initial attempts that Reed and Farah have in understanding Meridi put to mind my early days of living in Japan, earnestly wanting to communicate something important, but not quite knowing the best way to convey it. During the adventure, Reed, Farah, and Meridi will be joined by a scholar in the art of Kramel research, Kiel, and two optional characters, Max, the leader of a rebellion, and Chat, the granddaughter of a pirate king. The cast is well balanced and play off each other well, and despite Max being an optional character, along with Chat, he often found his way into my party due to his sheer strength and skill at wielding a cannon. Of the six characters, Meridi and Kiel are our spellcasters, whose abilities are determined by which greater Kramels they have residing within their Kramel cages, devices that are designed to house these deities. It's entirely up to you as to which greater Kramel to put into which cage, and this in turn determines which spells your character has access to. To create new spells, you need to fringe your cages together. New spells are decided not only based on the combination of greater Kramels, but also their levels. As like the Sordians in Tales of Destiny, the Greater Kramels can also be leveled individually, though their level reduces a little when a fringe is performed, so be careful. As for our other characters, both Reed and Farah have unique statistics that need to be increased for them to learn more skills. Reed can equip a plethora of bladed weapons, whose attacks fall into either the slash or thrust category. The more you use of either, the higher their proficiency becomes, which in turn imparts skills to Reed. Reed must also continuously use his skills to learn new ones which meant that older skills never became useless. Farah is the same, however her two stats are Punch and Kick, though as the adventure continues, various individuals will also teach her unique healing abilities that can come in very handy. Chat and Max, on the other hand, both have unique side quests that must be completed to earn new skills. Chat through looking for the legacy of her ancestor, the great pirate king Airfried, and Max by attempting to befriend cute little creatures called Miakas, who more often than not express disgust at wanting to be touched by Max through an electric shock that gives him inspiration for a new skill. Exploration of the two worlds comes in multiple forms, on foot by means of a disc of wind, a submarine, a large ship, and small flying devices just to name a few. There is a lot of variety to travel and many nooks and crannies to explore. On the world map, sometimes when you walk to a nondescript location, you'll end up in a field where there are items ripe for the taking. I really liked this as it encouraged exploration beyond the boundary of the narrative. Each of the dungeons were also designed with gimmicks and enticing side paths that hid treasure. I am glad to report that these treasures were generally worth going out of your way for, as opposed to the previous two games that placed common items in hard to reach chests. The addition of the freeze ring along with the sorcery ring added another means to solve puzzles, which was a nice touch. Most of the dungeons had a gimmick in which you needed to use either one of the rings, or observe the environment carefully in order to find the solution. Of the three Tales of games that I have reviewed, this game had the best designed dungeons by far. And there was no repeat of the Deris Emblem gimmick, thank Seyfert. As you are running around hostile areas, you will inevitably be drawn into battle. These take place on a separate screen using an evolution of the linear motion battle system found in the previous titles. Unlike the previous games, all characters in your active battle party will attempt to attack the enemy. Gone are the days where characters will stand around like wet bags of oat, waiting to be pummeled into porridge. Additionally, when a spell is cast, it will not freeze the battle, which adds an element of strategy in timing your spells correctly, also giving you an opportunity to avoid enemy spells. The exception to this is summons, which are cast by either Meridi or Kiel when a certain element reaches max status as outlined beneath the character's name on the UI. When a greater Kramel is called into battle, everything freezes so they can execute their attack, but I didn't mind this. During battle, you can control Reed directly or choose to control any of the other characters. They all play differently, but I ended up using Reed because he was a pretty straightforward general all-rounder. When attacking, you need to continue to hold the D-pad in the direction of the enemy, otherwise your character will run back to the rest of the party once they have executed their attack. Reed can thrust, jump, and attack, or slash the enemy, in addition to using any of the skills that you have bound to his skill buttons. He can also defend, which when timed correctly, 
will cut the damage taken by a marginal amount. Some enemies also have abilities that can be avoided entirely. If you press up on the D-pad, all characters in the active battle party will jump, sometimes completely mitigating any damage that would have been done from, say, a laser connecting with their faces. I enjoyed this versatility and am looking forward to how much further the system will be refined in future games. The only complaint that I have is that it was easy to press an attack on an enemy and stunlock them so that they couldn't retaliate between Reed wailing on them and the two spellcasters slinging spells, one after another. After battle you will get experience and residual gains to your TP, which is helpful in restoring any that you may have lost by using spells or skills. When a character gains enough experience they will level up. Greater Kramels can also level up and sometimes, depending on their combination, you may receive a notification about the Kramel cages, prompting you to fringe to find new spells. You will also gain gold that can be used to purchase items and equipment from stores around the world. A character can equip a weapon, defensive items, and up to two accessories that either prevent status ailments, shield from elements, or provide other benefits to the party. I often had a Sephira on Reed, which exponentially increased the amount of gold received after battle, and was a safer send, as everything was so damn expensive otherwise. For example, food in this game is used toward cooking, and not just put into a food sack, and just like real life, it can be quite highly priced. Cooking is a feature that was first officially introduced in this game, allowing you to create delicacies based on recipes that you have acquired to heal HP or TP, or impart other effects to your characters. In various areas, out-of-place objects will magically become a human through pyrotechnics beyond the technology of Inferior. The Wonder Chef, who will teach you various recipes and allow you to cook your way out of a dire situation. Sometimes he can be obvious to find, by being a very out-of-place item, where other times he might be a random box, or my favourite, a dude that has clearly had too much to drink. Once you locate him, he will give you a new recipe and a set of ingredients with which to cook. Any character can cook from the menu, however a character can only cook once between every battle, if the attempt to cook is successful, or multiple times until the character successfully creates a dish. Each character starts on no stars, and gradually becomes more proficient as they cook the same dish multiple times, meaning everyone has the opportunity to become a culinary expert and there will be no burnt, disgusting food on this trip. In addition to cooking, there are other side games that you can play, some which are one-offs within the narrative, and others that you can return to repeat. I might be in the minority, but I didn't enjoy many of these activities, especially the ones that broke up the story. For example, when you need to row down a river, and there's no benefit to doing it at all or to not hitting the sides, like what's the point? Or when you need to stop a train to deliver letters and it doesn't even really give you a chance to practice before you begin. Most of the minigames were not fun or inspired and felt like more of a chore, so I tended to avoid them or do the bare minimum to pass them. It feels like Team Wolf saw that contemporaries were putting in minigames and thought, let's ask all of our staff, including the mail clerk, what a good minigame would be and rather than curate the ideas, let's just use them all. Even the card game was an annoying ripoff of Uno, and at one point I thought perhaps I'd accidentally purchased a knockoff game called Merity Party. Tales of Destiny makes cameo appearances multiple times throughout the game, such as a quiz in Minch University that is conducted by Chelsea, or the fact that the collectible in the game is the infamous Lens, which created a war in the previous game. Don't worry, there's no loss for power this time around, as they are hidden in people's dresses, or in the most ordinary of places that it seems that they were carelessly cast away, and you will only find these if you furiously mash the X button when you are exploring every nook and cranny. The Lens can be traded with a woman named Irene at predetermined amounts for useful items. Titles also make a return in Tales of Eternia, though like previous games they do not serve any actual function. Some of these are difficult to get, such as being locked behind successfully mastering some of the ludicrous minigames that I didn't have the patience to get good at. As the titles are purely cosmetic, there was not really any incentive to go out of my way to get them. When I started the game, something that really stuck out was the amount of detail put into the graphics. As you're running to chase Farah in the beginning area, the grass on the side of the road is blowing in the wind. The environments all have intricate details that create the illusion of life and luster. All environments appear as though you're running across a painter's canvas, and is worlds above what we saw in the previous two games. Characters themselves are also more detailed, and able to emote, 
whilst also retaining the little emoji bubbles above their heads from time to time, representing excitement or a loss for words. The battle backdrops are detailed and enemies ominous looking this time around, so you're not always wailing on some cute little thing that looks like it belongs in a zoo. The spell effects are flashy and give gravitas to the weight of the power of the Kramals. My only complaint about the graphics is the FMV cutscenes. Whilst the opening one is nice, the others that occur from time to time through the narrative are very pixelated and sometimes dark, so it's difficult to see what's going on. I would have liked a bit more care put into this. Musically, the game has a few catchy tracks composed by Motoi Sakuraba and Shinji Tamura. I appreciated the variety in tunes and especially the differentiation between Celestia and Inferia. The former having a more haunting melody on the overworld, whereas the latter is more of a theme of adventure. The game also features voice acting which I didn't mind all that much. It only played in major event cutscenes, mostly, and even though some of the acting was a little stiff, it wasn't bad. My favourite track is called Royal Observatory. The industrial blocks smashing into each other, accompanied by the melody of curiosity of the astronomers looking for an answer in the heavens, is just magical. Tales of Eternia tells the story of two worlds that drift dangerously close to each other, locked together by the act of a deity. The themes of misunderstanding due to the fundamental lapse in understanding between two languages and the journey of self-discovery and repentance for an act committed in childhood was something that really resonated with me. With two worlds to explore, in addition to the seabeds of both, and the orbital ring between, there is so much to do and see that you will not be left wanting. Joining a smaller cast of characters who all grow and mature along the adventure, besides Max and Chat, was something that kept me pushing on until the end. A great battle system and excellent story is only slightly soured by the plethora of minigames that you're expected to complete, however don't let this stop you. If you even remotely enjoyed the previous two Tales of games, then you are going to be in for a surprise. You will not regret picking up this one, I promise. By the way, what are your thoughts on this game? Let me know in the comments. This has been Venoir with a review of Tales of Eternia for the Sony PlayStation Portable. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe for more great JRPG content. As always, take care of yourselves, and I hope to see you all again next time. Thanks again, and bye-bye for now.